Hi everyone, it's Rebecca M. Holtz again with the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, The Pivot, Living and Working During COVID-19. Once again, our moderator is John Carroll. John is president of Unlimited Performance. He is an expert in helping people, teams, and organizations be more productive, more profitable, and have more fun. John also serves on many low country boards in the area. We're so fortunate to have John serve on the executive board for the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, John. Hope you're doing well today. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, I, I'm glad to see you. Um, certainly after a long uh, holiday weekend, the Labor Day weekend, uh, there are people who are still uh, live that are looking at this as Monday when it's really Tuesday. So we're helping you deal with that a little bit by uh, trying to get back into the swing. So I thank you and welcome everyone to The Pivot, a weekly series of informational discussions on our local, regional, and national issues in the midst of and following the current pandemic. This event is presented exclusively by the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. My role as moderator is to introduce our guest, get the discussion started with some questions, and give those attending the event live the opportunity to participate by uh, using the chat or Q&A function, which Rebecca will be monitoring. Thank you for taking the time with your Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce to join fellow members in staying informed to help you care for your team, your clients and customers, and take care of business in post-pandemic conditions. You know, if ever accounting and finance could be considered an adventure, that time may be now, as laws, rules, and regulations change almost constantly in connection with relief efforts to help business across the country keep their doors open and their people employed. Our guest today has been fielding questions dating back to March when some businesses hit pause on their own and others were ordered shut. Our guest with us for today's discussion on business finance, operation and compliance during the pandemic is Joe Hinsky. Joe is a certified public accountant and member of Legree, Bailey, and Hinsky here in Mount Pleasant. Joe earned his bachelor's in business administration from Charleston Southern University, his master's degree in accountancy from the College of Charleston. His focus includes business tax planning and compliance, business transition and sale planning, estate and gift planning and compliance, general business consulting and advisory services, hospitality and tourism industry, restaurants, specialty inns, bed and breakfasts, individual tax planning and compliance, litigation support and trust planning and compliance, including trustee services. Joe is recognized as a certified specialist in estate planning by the National Institute for Excellence in Professional Education. He was recognized by the Charleston Regional Business Journal's annual 40 Under 40 Awards in 2009. Joe, I think you were 29 back then, right? And, and he was named Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce Member of the Year in 2018. He has served as treasurer of the Daniel Island Performing Arts Center on the board of the Friends of Keep Charleston Beautiful, past president of the Charleston Estate Planning Council, and of course, as treasurer of the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. His professional memberships include the South Carolina Association of Certified Public Accountants, and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Joe and his wife, Nikki, have two children, Ryan and Jack, and a dog, Zoe, and he enjoys spending time with his family, reading, watching sports, traveling, and live music and performances. Joe Hinsky, welcome to The Pivot. Thank you, John. It's good to be here. I'm glad to join you. So glad and to half have of the stuff today. you mentioned I'm not able to do right now with this pandemic. So it's, kind of, it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> there's, there's this long list and you've got yeah. about that many things that you can do. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So, so Joe, I spoke with a CPA friend this morning who said it's a great time to be a CPA. I think he was referring to the fact that the landscape of rules and regulations is more fluid than ever in an ever evolving environment. Would you disagree or agree and why? No, no, I, I completely agree. You know, one of, the, one of the things we say a lot is that accounting is an art, not a science. Even though there are, you know, specific rules and regulations, there's a lot of gray area. And right now with, you know, a rapidly changing environment, we're really able to work with clients to really help them 
to say, you know, take advantage of things as they come out. I mean, there's, you know, I've never had to learn tax law in March like I did this year. Um, you know, and, and pretty much every week, if not every other day, there's something coming out on these new, you know, whether it's PPP forgiveness or whether it's unemployment rules, you know, or whether it's these incentives and, and tax breaks that um, businesses or individuals may be eligible for and really trying to incorporate those into people's plan um, and having to switch. You know, a lot of people is, whether it's business, hey, we've made our budget, we're going, we know what to expect, we know what, what you know, revenue is going to look like, we know what customers are doing, or an individual, we kind of know what, you know, we're bringing in, we know what we're spending, we're able to kind of keep up with that. Now it's a much more fluid environment of, you know, everything of can I keep my people employed to the employee, am I going to have a job tomorrow? Or am I going to get a paycheck? Right. So it definitely is an evolving landscape that, you know, has been much more um, fluid than, than in any year past since I've been doing, uh, you know, taxes and accounting. Right. And, and you know, we, we, think of, we think of the professions, especially yours, as um, not necessarily life and death situations, but they are business life and death situations. Mm -hmm. These yeah, days, you know, particularly. I, I, the, one of the first things you're taught in accounting class is accounting is the language of business. So it is, that's how you really communicate how you're doing or know how you're doing or know what to do next is to fully understand the numbers. I mean, anytime I speak to college students or high school students, it's of, if you want to run a business, you need to have a good accounting background because that, that's what is counts the most on on all the you know and running a business or managing a business or owning a business is really understanding how the numbers come out right and that's uh boy you know i, I know in my own work um business fluency or business literacy is so critical not only in the executive suite but to the degree that the um that that the rest of the team understands enough about that profit and loss statement to mm -hmm. know where they make an impact and where they help and hurt um, can make a huge difference in the results. Yes, without a doubt. So, Joe, what's the most frequent question you're getting these days? Uh, you've got to get a lot of them concerning business finance related to the, the coronavirus, the pandemic, mm -hmm. the lockdown, the reopening, the laws changing. What's going on? So, you know, re really right now, there's three main areas that we're getting the bulk of our questions with. You know, one concerns the PPP loans, because now we're <clears throat> at the point of a business that had received the loan is kind of either, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end or running near the end of that forgiveness period. So now we're into the point of, okay, we've got it, we've structured everything, now how do we report for the forgiveness? What do we provide? Are we making sure it's forgiven? Which <clears throat> there's still questions about that, had, you know, two updates last week to the you know, Treasury frequently asked questions about the forgiveness and there's still some rules they haven't even defined yet, but yet we're at the point of getting forgiven. So kind of navigating that mess, as well as making sure they're putting aside some of that for taxes, because as of now, any expense you use to offset that loan to be forgiven you're not gonna to get to deduct. So you may end up where you've got a tax balance that you're not expecting. So preparing people for that. Um, you know, the second area is, is one of the things that just went into effect on September 1st is dealing with the payroll tax holiday, um, which is a little different. So I'll talk about that a little bit is that the employer has the option to forego collecting social security tax on the employee's paycheck, so on their net paycheck, only the employee share um, for the rest of this year, but then collecting extra for the first four months of 2021 to then basically pay it back. So it's not a forgiven amount, it's not a foregone tax, it's just a delayed collection tax. Um, again, it would, in theory, it would give the employee more money from now to the end of the year in their paycheck to use to you know, pay bills or catch up for maybe when they were unemployed or working less hours. Um, but then in January, their paycheck would go down because they'd be collecting the Social Security tax for January 
as well as the Social Security tax foregone for this year. Um, so, you know, there at say 12, you know, they get a 6.2% raise from now to the end of the year. And then their December 31st check on January 1st would actually drop 12.4% until the end of April to make up for that Social Security tax. So, you know, it's, it's the employee has no say in that. It's not an elect in or out for the employee. It's strictly the employer and it's a all or nothing case for those employees. So if I, as the employer, say we're going to do it, all my employees now automatically get a bigger paycheck and are destined to get a smaller paycheck starting in January. As the employer, though, I'm taking on some risk because what if that employee leaves before January? Now I'm still on the hook for their employment taxes, but they're no longer collecting a paycheck. <clears throat> so you say, well, Joe, we can solve that because we'll just their final paycheck will withhold whatever they foregone. Okay, well, one, it may not be enough money in that final paycheck for it. And two, there are Department of Labor rules on how much I can withhold out of a paycheck before I break those rules. So I can say, oh, well, their paycheck's big enough, but now all of a sudden Department of Labor says I can't withhold all that tax, I have to pay them in that check. And now when it comes time to do payroll taxes, I'm on the hook. So, you know, I, I think it was a good, intent with unintended consequences that aren't so good. Um, so, you know, I think there we're seeing most, at least most of the employers we're talking to are foregoing it. Um, the National ASCPAs, the Organization of CPAs, the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce are all saying this isn't a good deal. You know, as the employer, you shouldn't do this. It's not really a tax break. It, and, you know, if you're making $1,000 a week, yeah, I get $62 raise now, which would help for sure. But is that same person at $1,000 a week going to be able to afford losing another $62 in January and their pay going down? Um, is it going to reflect bad on the employer if they do that, where all of a sudden now the person gets upset and has to go find another job because their paycheck isn't enough, even though it's they've basically borrowed that money from their previous paychecks? You know, so that's that, that's a big area that we're getting lots of questions on. And really, then the third is much more from the individual side or the business owner side is, I need some funds. Where tax efficiently can I get those funds? Is it, you know, taking an early distribution or borrow, borrowing from my retirement plans? Is it foregoing funding my retirement plans? Is it, ooh, you know what, I'm just not going to pay taxes now and because I can use that cash flow for later. And am I going to get in more trouble or pay more because of penalties and interest later just by trying to save some cash now? So it's really some of those decisions of, you know, where do we get money to pay what we need to pay? You know, today in Charleston County, it was a big back to school day. You know, so there's, there's that issue too of, okay, I'm now my kids are home, you know, learning from home remote still. How do I, you know, and I'm working from home, are there any tax breaks I can take advantage of from having to work from home or maybe having to work less hours because I've got kids that I'm having to help homeschool um, because of their remote learning situation. So, you know, there's every, every phone call or email I get is a very different situation of, you know, where it may be a retiree on, well, how do I, you know, should I take more out of retirement? Or now that RMD is suspended, should I not take out of my retirement account this month or this year and use money from elsewhere? Or what I took out, should I put it back? Um, to everything from the business owner of, you know, I'm bringing back some of my employees, but I don't, you know, it's limited seating in the restaurant. I don't need all my servers. Who do I decide to bring back? Who do I decide not to? Um, you know, so it's a lot of those much more management type questions as a as in addition to tax questions. Wow, Joe, I can't imagine the, the depth of those. You must be getting pretty good at creating uh, uh, frequently asked questions so that the first three or four questions get uh, get taken care of before things get to the specifics, right? Yeah, People yeah want it's to know definitely helped to, to, you know, that we've devised some based on the, you know, the situation of, pretty much from when they first call, you know, of, okay, I need to go here and kind of here are some of the things I need to think about. Here's what, 
you know, and a lot of times it's the question they need answers, the question they're not asking. Um, so for us to have these cheat sheets and frequently asked questions that help us steer where to go. You know, I've, I've drawn more flow charts this year of yes, no, go this route than I've ever had in my whole career because of that to, okay, well, if, you know, if we, if they ask A and the answer is B, then, you know, really we need to get to G or F before we ever get, before we were done with their question. And then it, you know, the answer is going to lead to other questions and other questions. And, and it's a really fluid back and forth, um, you know, environment where, you know, thankfully we have things like this Zoom where we can address some of it and also, you know, address with clients of, you know, okay, well, let's jump on a Zoom call because it's a little bit easier to understand and see face than just over the phone to say, or an email of, okay, we'll do A, B, and C. Well, you know, you start seeing, oh, well, they, if they don't understand B, they can't do C and D. So, you know, it is much more, much more FaceTime we've ever had. You know, one of the thing people that, you know, if they don't deal a lot with an accountant or don't know any accountants, they think, oh, an accountant sits in a room and crunches numbers and doesn't talk to anybody. And you become accountant because you don't want to talk to anybody. When, you know, 95% of my day is talking to people and, and calling it. And then there's, you know, there's this back office stuff. But a lot of that is, you know, other CPAs that, that work for us that are doing a lot of that crunching to kind of get us to that point. So it is, you know, you, uh, and that's why I always tell people, you should have a good relationship with your CPA. You should feel comfortable being able to call them and ask questions. It's much easier for me to answer something up front than to try and fix it on the back end when we do your tax return because you messed something up really bad. Or you're, you know, you got a surprise of saying, oh, geez, you know, I didn't know I was going to owe that much if I took that money out of my retirement account. Why is it so high? Well, you know, we're a progressive system. So it pushed you up into higher and higher brackets on that next dollar, as well as you paid a penalty. And then you paid interest, you know, you paid penalty for not paying enough tax in throughout the year. So, you know, it's much more, um, you know, it's much more of a conversation and looking at the pieces of the puzzle to try and see how they all fit together. And no one can do that on their own without, you know, involving the financial professionals that know the rules and can anticipate those unanticipated consequences. Right. You know, Joe, there must be so much misinformation going around that you have to first oftentimes dispel what people are under the impression of. For example, I was under the impression at some point that with the, uh, the, payroll, um, the payroll holiday, the deferral, that employers could give em individual employees the option and they could choose by individual employee and the, and the employer would then have to adjust employee by employee, which would be a nightmare to manage, I would think. Right, right. You know, and then it was, you know, that, that whole thing passed, I think it was August the 8th for implementation of September 1st. It's something that never been done before. So any software for using payroll software is not anticipating that. So they're having to redo that on the fly. Again, it, it was a presidential declared order, um, which typically, is not how tax law is made. So you've got a completely different thing and had to work through, of, you know, the first thing we had to look at was, okay, you asked me, could we do this? And is it constitutional? Is the president allowed to do that? Now, you know, because it was under a code section that allows them during a disaster to delay the implementation of tax and collection, that it is allowed so it is, it is legal to do, but again, it's only a delay of the collection of the tax, not a abatement or forgiveness of that tax. So then it was, okay, well, is it an all or nothing thing? And the, you know, the systems aren't just are, if it's, you're doing it, you're going to do it. It's going to apply to everybody, whether the employer itself wants it, you know, and then to get back, it's, you know, in, in early in my career, the question always was, my neighbor got back a bigger refund than I did, how come? And that was the misinformation. And now with the internet being so more prevalent and YouTube and all these other things with stuff out that, you know, anybody can say anything and you don't know whether it applies. Um, 
I was pulling up some articles on something else this week. And if you're not paying attention, the top hit might be a six year old article that was, you know, two tax rules ago that no longer applies, but no one takes them down. They're out there. So you got to be really careful with that. And, and then the other thing with taxes is they're very specific in fact patterns. So you can find an article that says you can do A, B, and C. And what you didn't read is that that only applies to S corps and your tax is a partnership. And so none of it applies anymore. So there's a lot of those nuances that you can't always tell from reading an article if you're not really versed on, on the rules. And then, you know, the other thing is, is a lot of things have phase outs. So you say, oh, well, this is great. I can do all this stuff and save all this money. And then you realize that your income's too high to apply for any of that because you're phased out of that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things there that just, um, you gotta be careful as with taxes, just with anything else, you gotta be careful what you read on the internet or, you know, that you see on a YouTube channel or that someone, I guess with TikTok, I don't know if you TikTok taxes or not, but if it's there, it's probably, <laughs> I probably wouldn't trust it that that's where I'd get my tax advice. <laughs> Do people give tax advice while they're dancing on video, Joe? I, I don't uh, know. Maybe, you know, why not? <laughs> they do everything on TikTok. You might as well do tax rules. Maybe, maybe I need to look into that oh, expansion, of, expansion of our channel. Joe, talk a little bit about, and I, I know I didn't, I didn't uh, give you a heads up on this, but I'm, I'm guessing you have, have fielded this question before. Talk a little bit about how any client, not just uh, your clients, but how a client can best um, utilize the services, the knowledge, the expertise of a CPA mm -hmm. in general, but particularly so under these conditions. Right. Yeah. And, and really it's just, it's, it, it's developing a relationship with your accountant. Um, and, and then it's not of, you know, what I, what I tell my clients all the time is, you know, we're fielding constant phone calls, emails that is come up, you know, if you're, if you're got an issue or you're saying, you know, geez, my business is struggling. I'm not sure what to do. I always say, send an email and say, Hey, I really need to talk with you. You know, I don't know how long it'll take. I'm not even sure what we need to talk about, but we're having trouble with cash flow in the business. And then what we can do is then that gives us a chance to say, okay, I got your email. Let me look at what you've done before. If, you know, if we have access to current information, we'll look at that. And then I can kind of prepare some points to talk about and ask about. And then it's just of us say, okay, let's, you know, what are you available tomorrow? Here's some times that work for me. Let's get on a Zoom call or, you know, and, and, and go through, okay, really, what are your concerns? Because at the end of the day, John, what I found is most, what most people ask isn't really the question they need to know. That's just the leader. So if you kind of give me what you think you want to ask or what you think you're struggling with and give us a chance to kind of look at it and think about it, then we can kind of talk through and I can kind of almost ask the right questions that lead you to what your question actually is. And so that, that's just it. You know, we're getting, it, you know, if it's, uh, oh, you know, I'm just going to call and, you know, and if I pick up, you ask me the question, I'm not in that mindset to really be prepared to answer it or to ask you the right question. So you ask me the right question. So to me, it's always that of, okay, well, let me shoot an email. Let me say a couple things that are bothering me or what's that. Um, but, you know, and then it's, it's, it's when we actually do talk, it's actually being open and honest with us as the accountant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't paint a clearer picture because you, you know, are afraid of what it looks like, or, you know, that I'm going to, I'm not going to fire you as a client, <laughs> just because you asked a certain question or not. But, you know, it's really of saying, okay, you know, let's really get honest, because we really need to know what it is that you're struggling with so that we can help you. Um, now, I will say, you know, the other thing I tell college students, if you want to be an accountant minor in um, psychology, because you end up, you know, there are some clients that tell you way more than what you want to hear. Um, so you don't need to tell me all your personal feelings, but really to be honest and truthful about the business and what you're struggling with, with the business or with your personal finances, because that can help us get to a better answer faster and solve the problem. Whereas, 
you know, if you're just kind of trying to sugarcoat it or, you know, oh, well, I don't really want them to know how bad it really is. Well, then you're not really helping anything. You're just really wasting both of our time and resources that could be put to use. And you might get when you might not have end up being able to save the situation later that you could have now. So, you know, that's the biggest thing is that, and that's why I like the face-to-face -face and the Zoom because a lot of times I can read if somebody's really holding back a little bit and say, you know what, I don't think you're being completely honest because the rec the, what I'm looking at is way worse than what you think it is. So either you're not being truthful to yourself or you're not being truthful to me and that's not helping us. So, I mean, that's really it. And then it's, you know, it's, it's not only having that relationship when things are bad, but also as they progress. So the best thing is that, oh, you know, hey, Joe, I, you know, I, I got to put aside all this money for taxes and I've got all this money. And, you know, so when good times, there are other things we can do to, to help that situation. So it's not just using us in times of, you know, struggle or strife, but it's using us when times are good as well. And because really, the end of the day, the more the better relationship you have with your accountant and, and tax professionals is the better opportunities there are to save you even more money. You know, our goal is over three years as a client, I've saved you more than I've cost you. I don't want to be a cost center. I want to be a, you know, a, a potential profit or, or revenue source of, you know, we're saving more money. We're doing more for the future. We're doing more for our kids in our retirement at the expense of the tax man, not at the expense of our, you know, current living situation. Right, 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 right. In other words, they're getting, your client is getting a return on investment because of the guidance, because of the advice, because right. of the expertise yeah. that you bring to the table. Right. And, you know, and maybe it costs them a little more because we're spending more time in doing it, but then that allows more opportunities to come up where they can do tax efficient business operations or savings personally and and how do we do that oh let's okay this year's bad great what opportunities are there maybe we convert some of your retirement money to a Roth account now because we're in a, such a low tax bracket you know so there are opportunities to plan when incomes way down as well as when incomes way up and I think that's what a lot of people don't want to really think about, but at the end of the day, you're still saving taxes long-term. And especially now when we look at, you know, the PPP loan we talked about briefly, that's $3.1 trillion in stimulus. If they make the forgiveness non-taxable, meaning you can deduct your expenses, now you're probably up to four and a half or $5 trillion of government cost. We're gonna have to pay for that at some point. Tax rates will have to go up. We've been spoiled that in, that in really good times, they haven't really increased tax rates astronomically. So we've been living always on low tax rates for the last at least 12 years. That's got to change and it'll have to change at some point. So how do we take money now when we're maybe in a lower bracket and convert it so we don't have a bigger tax bill later? It's counterintuitive to you know, tax planning that from when I came out of school was always defer, 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 defer. Now it's maybe, ooh, maybe we don't want to defer as much as we used to. Maybe we want to look at other, and there's more vehicles now to do maybe a Roth IRA where I pay tax on what I put in, but not what I take out when I retire to try and lower our overall tax rates. And, and Joe, I, you know, when I hear you talk about the relationship, I think the biggest thing that occurs to me is that um, the relationship is such that you really want to have the conversation before it's too late for you to help. Right. Right. Yep. And a lot of times it's in, you know, and, and that's what I say, it, if, you know, anybody if, that watches and says, you know, gee, I don't have that relationship, you know, and I need to try and get it. It's if you don't feel you've had it before, then you probably need somebody to switch before the end of the year. So talk to other accountants to start seeing who's a good fit. Because if, it's, if you wait until we do the tax return, there is 20% of what's able to do after year end that we could do versus now. So mm -hmm. it's a, you know, it's, that's why I say, is people bring in stuff and I haven't talked to them in a year, there's not a whole lot I can do for them. But if we've talked during the year, then I kind of know, oh, hey, yeah, they've done A, B, and C. So we know we've already saved that piece. They say, well, I don't want to, you know, 
if I talk to you during the year, you're spending time, it'll increase my bill. Well, I'm either going to spend time now or I'm going to spend time in March when I'm doing your return trying to clean it up or trying to figure out, Jesus, you know, they tell me they can't pay this much. Is there anything else we can do to try and drive this thing down? Where there's five things we could have done if we'd done it in November and December, and there's maybe only one thing we can do in, in March. So, it, you know, it's much more of that kind of an ongoing thing. It's, you know, the, to me, the worst client is the one that you see once a year to bring you an envelope of stuff and say, see you next year. That's not a client that's getting a lot of, of value for what they're doing. You know, you're not able to then have that conversation during the year because you don't know what's happened and you're trying to do things later to try and affect the number prior. And the worst thing for me is when I do a return and I say, man, if, you know, if we would have just talked in November, we could have cut this bill in half and it's just wasted. Um, and so, it, you know, it's that, it, I think there's always that opportunity there to do something to drive down some taxes, save some money if you're being, you know, planning. To me, it's no different than if you do a marketing plan for your business and you're not doing anything to, you know, evaluate what it's done for you. If you're not measuring what the marketing plan is doing, you're not really measuring what your tax bill is doing until you pay your bill once a year to, here's your tax bill, this is what you're paying. Whereas if you look at the, during the year, you're saying, okay, I can do these small things here and there. And then the other thing is if I tell you something, oh, in March you can save this tax, but you know, to save five grand, you gotta have 25 grand of cash to do this. Well, if we had known that in November, now you've got six months to come up with that money to start putting it aside to say, okay, I know I'm going to have that tax bill. Let me put aside X amount per week to be able to pay it instead of trying to come up with it all at once, which then what usually happens is we don't pay it and we're riding up fees and, you know, late, late payment fees and interest. Or we say, okay, well, the only place I got money is my retirement account, so I'll take it out of there. And now we've just created a problem for next year too, and the following year, and the following year. So it's really of trying to have that plan. And, and now, you know, again, with COVID and everything that's gone on, we've had to change those plans during the year, but there are opportunities that we can do that maybe tax effectively. Joe, thanks. I want to switch a little bit and tie back to something else you mentioned. The, you mentioned that uh, this year uh, and this year only, I understand, uh, the government has removed the required minimum deduct or uh, what's the D for? Distribution. Thank distribution. you for from retirement accounts, right? Right. For people of a certain age, and talk a little bit about the impact of that. Talk about the the uh, the implications of uh, being able to have that flexibility this year. Yeah. So they've done two things with the RMD. So in the past, if you were over seventy, once you turned seventy and a half you had to take out a minimum amount of your retirement accounts based on your life expectancy for that age. Um, the first thing they've done is starting now, it's till 72 instead of 70 and a half. So if you turn 70 and a half in 2020, you really now get another year and a half without having to take it. But if you are already taking it, then for 20, again, for 2020 only as of right now, they've suspended you having to take anything out of the account. So one is you get that money stays in the account to then further grow tax-free. So, you know, the theory was we're gonna waive it because the stock market went down with COVID. We're gonna let you try and recover some of it before you have to take it out. And it's based on the prior year 1231 balance. So 1231.19, you know, stock market was pretty high. So now all of a sudden, if you've dropped 20% and you're having to pull 20 more percent out, you've got less chance to recover for later. So again, if it's, it's ability to change it in there. The other thing is a lot of people, you know, if, if you're over 70 and a half and taken that, you may not, you know, you may not have any other income other than some investments in social security. So now if I drop your, if I don't take the RMD, I've dropped my adjusted gross income, which now may be, less of my social security is now subject to tax. So if I was in a 24% tax bracket, it might've really been more of a 28 or 30% bracket because of the tax I was paying on my social security benefits. 
So now I've saved even more by doing that as well as then. So now I've got a, a better return on my investment, more opportunity for my money to grow tax deferred as well as to pay less taxes this year um, and do some other things. There's still the RMD that allows you to give up to 100,000 directly to charity. So what we've done is we've um, advised some clients, you still wanna give the money to the charity out of the RMD, but you don't wanna take any money from yourself. And let's start spending some of those other assets where you're getting a, you know, what, a half a percent interest rate out of your savings account. Right. You know, we don't, that's not gonna change. Let's go ahead and use some of that money and let the, you know, let the money that's invested in the market through your retirement accounts try and get the rebound as the economy recovers. Right, 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 right. Wow, so much to think about and consider these days, isn't there? Um, it, it really, it, you know, and it's, it's a individual by individual kind of look at what, where they're at. You know, on some people I said, well, I'm gonna take more than my RMD because my dividends have gone way down and some of my other stuff has gone down. So I'm gonna be in a lower bracket, so I wanna take more out to take advantage of this lower bracket. So, you know, there are where, the, again, one size doesn't fit all with any tax planning. It's, it's definitely a facts and circumstances, case by case basis. Right, yes indeed. Hey Joe, uh, let's bring Rebecca in. And uh, there may be a question that she has fielded or one that she has for you. Um, thank you, John, thank you, Joe. Very informative and thank you for explaining that so well to someone like me who, <laughs> Um, really accounting not one of my favorite topics. So thank you so much for um, explaining everything that's going on right now. It sounds like with the payroll tax holiday, it's definitely not a holiday in the true sense that we, you know, we get a vacation from having to ever pay it. Not, that's not how it's working out. Is there a type of company that uh, when looking at this new uh, opportunities, maybe not the best word, but looking at, I guess, opportunity to take a payroll tax holiday for a while. Is mm -hmm. there a type of company that you would say, yeah, it's a good fit for you or most of the time it isn't? Yeah, you know, generally it's not. Where, where we've really seen where it could be beneficial would be for companies that are very family owned oriented, family employee. Um, or even, you know, key long-term employees that you don't expect anything to happen to in the short term. So if there's, you know, if you say, you know, everybody's been here a long time, they're not leaving, we know each other, we're all family or like family, work family, then that might be an opportunity for them. Again, you're getting really only a four month deferral on this money. So it's not like you say, oh, well, I'll take, you know, as the employee, I'm going to take that 6% and go put park it somewhere for the four months and earn a bunch of money on it. It's not a big enough money. You know, it's not a big enough deferral where you're really going to save it. You know, what we see anytime there's these little cuts like this is people tend to say, oh, well, you know, that's really only, you know, we go out to dinner one more time per pay period because, and that's what we we'll use that money for. So, you know, it's, it's almost too small to create a big difference where you can really do something with it or, you know, use it to really affect your future. Um, but, you know, where we've seen it again is if it's a company where you know everybody and you've got a good retirement plan and maybe they're not fully contributing to the retirement plan to say, you know what, why don't you take this? We'll do the holiday. We'll take this money. We'll up your contribution to the 401k so you don't get any more money but now you've put more money in this retirement account. And in January, you're gonna get a raise, so you're not gonna really feel it anyway because you'll the raise will kick in. And so for the four months, you'll earn a little bit less, but then in, you know, in, in May, you'll kind of go back up to where you should be. So you know, there it's a way to maybe get some money into, more money into a retirement plan. But again, there's limits on what you can earn to participate, which is only about 104,000 a year of salary. So, you know, at that, you're, you're only looking at, you know, six, $700 for the four months that you're able to push off. So it's not like I could say, oh, let's take this money and we're going to put it in your kids 401 or your kids 529 plan for college. And this is really going to help you to pay for them for college. It's not enough or not a long time, enough time period to really 
to really make a big benefit for that. It's really, a, to me, it's a gimmick of trying to boost everybody's pace that they spend the money, which is really what the government wants, is to kind of spur spending, but then it's gonna hurt you too much on the back end. That really goes back to what you mentioned that it's important for your clients to touch base with you more than once a year. Correct. So when something like this comes up, you already have in mind what what right. their situation is and can yeah. advise them accordingly. So, yeah. And you know, and again, you know, John asked a question about the misinformation. Most of the employers asked us this question because their employees had read something about them not having to pay taxes in September through December, you know, and, and never was, you know, didn't understand that they were going to pay it back in January and there, you know, so what we actually did for several clients was, take a, a you know, average client or average employee scenario and say, here's what they would have gotten now. Here's what they're gonna get on September 1st if they elect this. And then here's what they're really gonna get on January 1st of next year. And then when they, they show that to the employees, the employers is like, well, I can't live on that amount in January. So, you know, I'm doing okay now. Yeah, I'd love to have $60 more paycheck, but that's $30 a week. That's you know, what is that? I mean, that's, like I said, that's dinner. And that's probably not even, that's more like lunch. So then, okay, now I've got to make big cuts back next year to be able to pay this back. And I didn't do anything with it. You know, it's just, to me, it's at the end of the day, it's going to be a buyer's remorse of why did you do this? This only hurt me. So the employer is just going to be in a bad spot in my mind with, without anything. And, you know, part of it is mis misnomer is the holiday right? The biggest tax holiday we have is early August. They have South Carolina sales tax holiday where you can go buy school stuff or school, when I say school, wedding dresses were exempt forever. Um, but during that weekend, you don't pay the state sales tax. So everything automatically becomes 6% cheaper or more depending on where you are. So that's a holiday. You don't pay that back at some point. It's forgiven. So to say this is a payroll tax holiday, when it was first proposed, it was, okay, we're not gonna collect this for this four months. That would be great. That would spur the economy. That would cause people to spend it. Everybody could take advantage of that. Now with it being a loan, it's not, it's, it's not an effect, effective way to try and stimulate the economy. It's just kicking the can down the road and it's not even kicking it down far enough to make a difference. Okay. Rebecca, thank you for the question and Joe, Thank you, Joe Hinsky, uh, CPA uh, with Legree and Bailey and Hinsky here in Mount Pleasant. Thanks to all. Oh, Joe, give us a final thought, if you will, and uh, where people can find you. Yeah, I, I think the final thought would be, again, build that relationship with your accountant. If you don't have one now, really kind of start that conversation, start to engage more. Um, even, you know, make sure you're checking out their website to see what, because they'll either have blogs or they share articles. You know, we share a lot on Facebook and, um, and Twitter and, and LinkedIn to try and share things of, hey, this is a great article that explains this. If you, you know, read it and say, hey, maybe this doesn't apply to me, maybe it does. If you don't know, then that's the time to, to make that one of your questions. Um, and then, like I said, we're in Mount Pleasant, Legree Bailey Hensky, www.lbhcpas.com. And always through the, the great Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. Wonderful. We know where to find you there, Joe. Thank you. And thank you to all of our chamber members who are with us live and those catching us on the recording. A big thank you, as always, to the Mount Pleasant Chamber's own Rebecca Impulse for keeping us on track today. From all of us at the Mount Pleasant Chamber, thank you for joining us this week for The Pivot. Make it a great week. Thank you.